Welcome to task P-5111, identify what to look for during damage assessment in orthomosaic or FPV imagery. Let's get started. CAP may get called upon to help with damage assessment resulting from natural or man-made disasters. Natural disasters may result from weather-related phenomena like hurricanes, flooding, tornadoes, fire, or other incidents. Man-made disasters might include this train fire, radiation, acts of terrorism, and that's the 9-11 museum in the background and the monument pool in the foreground, or war. CAP is normally tasked with supporting FEMA during disaster relief incidents, which is one of the reasons why you have a collection of emergency management courses inside our UAS curriculum. It's crucial to give these courses their due since they help you to understand how you fit and function inside the larger national response effort. CAP's primary focus during damage assessment will usually be preliminary damage assessment, which is defined as a mechanism used to determine the impact and magnitude of damage and the resulting unmet needs of individuals, businesses, the public sector, and communities as a whole. Now, whatever you do, don't rush in without a comprehensive briefing beforehand. This is because conditions that cause the damage may still be there. Roads might be closed by local authorities, or they may just be destroyed. If you can get there, the area might be unrecognizable. Get briefed and be on the lookout for airplanes, helicopters, and other SUAS teams in the area. Whenever possible, do a digital recon of the area beforehand so you can get an idea of what it looked like prior to damage. Digital recon will also help you preemptively discover errors and coordinates, preventing you from going to the wrong location and wasting valuable time. Once you finally do head out to the target, don't make the mistake of having tunnel vision. Civil Air Patrol is Semper Gumby, always flexible. And two ways you can demonstrate flexibility are first, while en route or on scene, be on the lookout for additional locations that have sustained damage, but which command might not be aware of. Make notes on your map before proceeding. Second, be open to retasking since situations can develop quickly, which may lead to swiftly changing target priority. You may have a wide variety of targets for damage assessment, for instance, you could be sent to do quick status reports on roads and streets, looking for cracks or breaks, or confirming the integrity and usability of helipads or runways, or you may get sent to investigate critical infrastructure or utilities like railways, bridges, gonna need to find another way across that river, power lines. If they're down, you might not be able to charge your batteries without generators or a vehicle with an inverter. Pipelines, which could be leaking hazardous material. Water lines, which if ruptured could, could flood the area, but also might interrupt the ability of firefighters to combat fires. You might also check out water towers in the area. Hospitals, are they up and running? Have any levees failed? Have any dams failed? When responding to these disaster events and inspecting targets, you want to keep the following investigative questions at top of mind. First, what is the severity of damage? This neighborhood got battered by a passing tornado sustaining moderate damage to some homes this entire neighborhood was a total loss. What is the geographical extent of the damage? We're here at Chalmette, Louisiana, population 17,000. Severe storms caused the river to overflow into the city. FEMA sends your SUS team in to fly the city perimeter and record data about exactly how far flooding has traveled inland. You take primarily video while also picking up GPS markers of the flood boundaries along the way. 
The process of grabbing GPS coordinates using DJI's Find My Drone feature is outlined in our video on Task 0-5001. Ask yourself, is damage spreading? If so, try to record what direction and how fast that change is occurring. Are there any plumes nearby? In our scene here, floodwaters destroyed a key regulator at the local plant and an explosion happened, releasing a smoke plume. Make sure to record direction and speed of any such plumes since they may be hazardous to public health. What is the status of critical access and egress routes? Floodwaters appear to have overtaken State Route 47, a key transportation route through the area. Resources are inbound and need to know if they should reroute or continue on. Now, our SUS team is also in the area and can report State Route 47 as viable for east-west traffic despite the widespread flooding which surrounds it. And we've changed the status of this road to green on our map now. What are the primary active hazards in the area and are any secondary hazards present? In this scenario, flooding is your primary active hazard. The eastbound plume is a secondary hazard and we've identified additional secondary hazards after an overflight of two industrial areas. Now, both these locations appear to have damaged industrial containers and the contents are leaking into the floodwaters. Command has been advised of the potential chemical hazard, and our SUS team is preparing another sortie to scout for any visible hazard placards on the side of those containers, and then if successful, we'd know more about just how dangerous the leakage is. You want to be continuously mindful of where your emergency bases and rallying points are and be comparing those locations against any spreading disasters. Are those locations under threat? When Chalmette first flooded, emergency services established a command post from Jackson J. Davis Elementary School, but now the floodwaters have cut off the North Access Road and water is within 200 feet of the rightmost building. Forces are ordered to leave out the rear entrance and proceed either south or west, depending on their tasking. How have the local utilities been affected? We investigated a nearby power station. It still looked great and was safely outside the disaster zone for now. Next, we flew a stretch of power lines that run through the city. Uh, many poles still stood, though others had begun to fall, and it was only a matter of time before power would finally cut out. If there's immediate problems facing your rescue operations, or if known problems are expected to become an issue soon, how good are you at spotting alternatives? You'll recall the emergency responders got flooded out of their first forward operating base, but they headed west to regroup. Our SUS team was able to identify another power station with working power two and a half miles west, so emergency responders regrouped at a nearby church with good facilities, extra parking, and space that could double as helipads. During sorties, be sure to keep an eye out for signals from survivors. Earlier while flying our power line inspection, we noticed a green laser to the north and then called in additional SUAS team support to investigate. Sure enough, a concentration of survivors was discovered signaling from the Chalmette Monument. They had ran inside and up to the top when floodwaters came rushing. Now the exit was submerged and they were effectively trapped. Breaking out a window at the top, one began signaling with a laser. The inbound SUS team used a speaker equipped drone uh, to make contact and assure the survivors that they were on our radar and to stand by for rescue efforts. You'll be recording information in at least three different ways uh, by directly annotating local maps, by filling out your 109Us and through capturing imagery. It's important to have local maps on hand so you can indicate the scope of damage in a visual way quickly by sketching it. Now this scene here is a good example of a well annotated map. However, we do need to add a few more things. Um, be sure to write in the lat long for each flood boundary marker and also mark locations for the chemical spills and survivor concentrations. Let's add a description of the event. 
type and extent of damage and the status of the incident. Then for each location, you'll want to fill out the 109U. Um, as an example, we've got our Shalmet monument sortie filled out here. Our summary captures the positive results of the sortie. Survivors know we have them on radar, and we know they're uninjured and not in immediate danger. In order to properly assess damage using SUS, FPV, and Orthomosaic Media, you need to be aware of system capabilities and limitations. A multi-rotor's overall agility along with their ability to loiter allows the pilot to capture all sides of the target more easily. Whenever possible, capture all sides and even underneath if necessary. While in motion with an SUAS, you'll introduce a corresponding motion blur in your live feed, which can distort the image and make it difficult to search for targets or survivors. Your feed will be much clearer if you stop and scan at predetermined intervals. The ability to assess damage from orthomosaic imagery depends on the resolution of your final map. This map indicates it's at 0.5 centimeters spatial resolution, which means each pixel represents about 0.2 inches of space on the ground. At that resolution, it's no wonder you can pick off the numbers from the tank. Let's look now at what kind of spatial resolution you can get with the DJI Phantom 4 Pro drone and the free mapping ground control station software PIX4D Capture. We're inside PIX4D Capture now on an iPad. Let's get into settings. Then I'll make sure my Phantom 4 Pro is chosen. Now let's go to grid and make a 2D map. So first you'll find your target using the global map, then place and expand the flight path box to encompass the target. To the left, you can see we're mapping at 200 foot AGL and expecting a spatial resolution of 1.31 inches per pixel. Time to complete is an estimated at about 17 minutes. On the right, we've descended to 150 foot AGL, which has increased our expected spatial resolution to 0.98 inches per pixel, but at the cost of an additional two minutes mapping time for a total sortie time of 19 minutes. So you have uh, potential spatial resolutions of 1.31 and 0.98 inches per pixel, but what does that mean in context? Well, let's put some perspective on it. FEMA publishes the Preliminary Damage Assessment Guide, and inside, towards the back, there's an appendix which provides guidance on what resolutions they prefer for airborne imagery. Satellite imagery should be at least 20 inches per pixel, so those pixels are big and coarse. They want high-res airborne shots to be 10 inches per pixel, but FEMA says they prefer high-res oblique shots with 6 inches per pixel. And then with a Phantom 4 Pro and PIX4D, we're getting 0.98 inches per pixel at 150 feet. You can see now by comparison how small your pixels are. And again, smaller pixels mean finer details and better quality. In order to turn your high quality imagery into a map that you can assess damage from, it's necessary to choose the right settings inside your preferred mapping software. In this instance, we're using PIX4D Mapper on Windows running good hardware and processing 159 photos of a nearby wash. We're pushing this map out quickly to IC, so we've chosen rapid quality, which took 16 minutes and produced a file size of 22 megabytes. This will be a map that gives IC an overview of the area and enhances their situational awareness, but lacks fine detail. Let's zoom in here and we'll look closer at the details. We've noticed something that looks like debris near the center of the photo. Getting closer now, let's take a look at the bottom debris, but it's impossible to tell what this is. Now we've switched to high quality and it greatly enhanced fine detail. You can make out what looks like a tire here, which is enough of a clue to send out another sortie searching for our missing plane. This level of detail may also be necessary if you were scouting a map for cracks and breaks in a roadway. If you take a look at our stats on the left, processing time has increased to 34 minutes and file size has jumped to 250 megabytes. 
Thanks for coming to class today. If you'd like to see more of these videos in the future, let us know by liking and subscribing. Take care and we'll see you in the next one.